to replace these things. Okay. Let me. We started this last week. We kind of got through it a little bit. Everybody, did everybody get handouts? Come up and get handouts. So everybody has the handouts that we're going to go through tonight. And I'll get through this again. Okay. And the reasons you guys can help me go through the first part. Why do we have appraisals done? Who needs appraisals? Who? Why? Why do we get appraisals done? Buyers. Buyers. For the lender. For the for the lender. lender. Primarily lender. for the lender to make sure it's market value. Why other reasons do we get appraisals done? Seller maybe to see what the price, what they can sell okay. for. And they can do a formal appraiser or they can do competitive market analysis, which is not the same as a formal appraisal. But as realtors, you will do competitive market analysis. That's how you're selling yourself to your clients to get a listing. You're doing a CMA so they understand what's their property worth. The other reasons we get appraisals is people die. So I did a lot of work when I was in the trust department. People died. I wouldn't know every day I'd go in who's dying today. What's going on? I have to go look at a property to make sure we'd want to be the executor. Because when we're the executor, it came in the name of the bank. And we didn't want our name on it if the problem property had a problem, like an environmental issue or something like that. So you, you get it for estate purposes, for tax purposes, for evaluating what something is worth. Um, when people are appraising their estate, they want to figure out what their whole estate is worth or doing estate planning, they might get appraisal at that time too. So there's a lot of reasons we have appraisals done. And we're going to talk about the process of getting appraisals done. Um, and obviously it's opinion value. Everybody has them. Um, but as an appraiser, we support that. If, if there is a scientific method to how we gather the evidence and how we put this form together that you're going to go through tonight that proves the value. It's a value for a moment in time. It's the moment in time that the appraiser says, as of this date, this is the value that I'm putting on this property. It could change 10 days from now. It could change months from now, whatever. But this is also why when we're trying to do competitive appraisals, we're trying to find properties that have sold within the last six months or closer when we're doing residential. We can always find those. When we do commercial reports, we might have to go, we might have to draw a bigger net to get our competitive properties. We might have to go back in time. If we're doing that, we have to make some adjustments, too, because of the area and the time factor. So the appraiser is an independent appra uh, professional. They're trained. They have plenty of training. Uh, there's a lot of hours of training that a residential appraiser and a general appraiser, commercial appraiser, have to go through before they can sit for the test. There's a lot of training that they have to go through. Um, Appraisers have requirements. Um, there's the Institutional Financial Institutions Reform Recovery Enforcement Act that kind of regulates the appraisal activities. And then the biggest one, the one you'll see most often, is something called USPAP, which is Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice. These forms that we're talking about, they are kind of adopted by this USPAP guidelines. The forms I handed out to you tonight, I've given you... Um, the appraisal report, you've got one that's all done. This is the one my son had to pay twice to get done. This is his house in Kentucky. Um, even though it's in Kentucky, it's Ohio, similar format, similar law, all that kind of stuff. You'll see the appraiser certification on the back. You'll see the disclaimers, everything in the full report. So that's to give you a full report so you know how they're filled out. You have a basis for thought. The thing Ed may not go through is the residential green energy addendum because I'm a lead AP this is something I like to talk about um, green homes so the appraisers out there use cap realizes we come into this market where we're trying to green home how do we say this green home has different things values to it versus a regular home so they have this residential green energy efficient addendum that they add to the, to the appraisal that spells out what are the green and these kind of things that they've done. There's also something called an energy green efficient features checklist. And this is something that will help you when you're advertising a property. And in the back of this page, I also have some vocabulary for green properties. What is LEED, Leadership in Energy Environmental Design, Energy Star, Home Energy Score, PERS, the Home Energy Rating System. The building envelopes, geothermal, things like that that are part of our green homes. And then finally, this is in your textbook as well. It's a blank appraisal form so that you can play with this. And when you guys are taking your, your Monday night class, you'll appreciate some of the things I'm giving you because this is a process 
that you're going to go through is the appraisal. You will do some kind of appraisal with Ed as a teacher. You will pick a property, you will do an appraisal. So that's kind of why I'm going through all this stuff to give you a start. Then you have all these. I'm going to move you in there. I got to put there. Okay, so we've got the appraisal form that you're gonna you'll have to look at. We have organizations that appraisers belong to. Okay, any real estate organization, I do property management. There are different real estate organizations that property managers belong to. The Institute of Real Estate Managers, the BOMA, Building Managers Association. Appraisals, the appraisal group has their own associations as well, organizations. The reason you want to know about organizations for whatever field you go into in real estate or whatever your professional career is, these organizations are out there to give you professional guidance. Most of them have some kind of education attachment to them. They have educational programs. If you want to become good at what you're doing, you'll go through their education programs. They also have scholarship opportunities. So any of these organizations, if you are really interested in trying to become certified through the appraisal organization or certified property manager or CCIM, there are, um, what do you call it? I'm drawing a blank here. There are scholarships that you can get to take these classes. So I have work that helps me pay for some stuff, but I've done scholarships before to get some of these classes done as well. So don't hesitate when you see something, if you're really interested, to apply for a scholarship. I did CCIM classes years ago, and I took two of them, three of them, on scholarships that I applied for and got. It took a while to get them, but I did it. Now I've taken them so long ago, if I want to become a CCIM, I have to take the classes over again. Um, but they also do kind of have an expiration period. So all these organizations are out there for appraisers. Do the same kind of thing. Um, the National Right-of-Way Association, um, Esley, who's in our Wednesday night class because of the kind of work he does, with Duke Energy, they have a lot of people that are with the International Right-of-Way Association. They're doing the type of work. They're helping Duke Energy and other utility companies get the easements and the things that they need to do appraisals for their easements um, to do utility work. The appraisal, again, the process, you're going to do a competitive market, comparative market analysis from recently sold properties. You're going to look at properties currently on the market. You're going to look at expired listings. Again, this is not a formal appraisal, but this is what you're going to do when you're starting out the process to, to get a listing engagement to, ex to explain to them. The reason you want to look at properties currently on the market, this is your competition. Recently sold, those are the properties we really use for the appraisal process because until a property is sold, you don't know what it's going to sell for. That's determining its market value. The day the property sells, is its market value. So until it's sold, you can't really use it for anything but it, you know, you gotta wait for that for the appraisal. Expired listings, again, competition in the marketplace. What's going on with expired listings? If they're expired, that means they're probably gonna come back on the market again. But why did they expire? Did they expire because somebody was asking too much money? Or did they expire just over time? It's important as a realtor to understand why there's expired listings out there because they are competition in the marketplace. Again, these are not an appraisal, but they're part of the real estate process. The broker's price opinion, usually less extensive than a competitive market analysis. Again, not an appraisal, but it can be used for when people die or business appraisals, things like that. Very often, instead of doing a formal appraisal, if it's not a federally kind of ingested for money or things like that, they may just go pay for a BPO, broker's price opinion, to learn what they think the value is worth. A broker in the marketplace, they're going to brokers that are experienced that know the market, and they're saying, you're a professional, tell us what you think the value is and why. So again, less extensive than CMA. Typically, it might just be a couple pages or even just a written few paragraphs to say this is why your property is worth this. So the appraisal process, you're identifying the problem. You're going to determine the scope of work. Scope of work in a residential is filling out this paperwork. Scope of work in a commercial appraisal can be 150 pages. So again, when we're starting this process, what are we doing? What's our goal for the scope of work? Are we just going to do the residential paperwork and forms? That's fine. Are we going to add a green and lead addendum? What are we going to do? We're going to gather, record, and verify our data. We're going to analyze the data. What? Okay. 
Ideally, we want to get six properties that are truly competitive properties. We want to be able to throw three of those away and pick the very three best to keep in our appraisal report. But this is the analyzing the data. We go out and get six or nine. What are the three best? Why do we want to keep these? They're the closest to our subject property, least amount of, of um, adjustments that we need to make. Want to form opinion of the land value. Like I said, land has a separate price than a building on it. So you have to determine what is the land value. In the land value, you're going to do a similar approach. Go out and find land sales to see what the land value is worth to, to determine that. You're not just saying, oh, the property is 45000 therefore the land should be worth 10%. We're never doing that. We're actually out there in the marketplace to find land sales to get competitive values. We want to form opinions of value with the three approaches to value. You have a cost approach, you have the market data approach, and you have an income approach. The, the income approach is not appraisal value that we use when we do residential appraisal. Because unless you're buying a home to be an investment property, the income approach doesn't really apply. The cost approach is something we look at. What does it cost to build a house? Okay, I did this exercise a couple weeks ago with my insurance company. I got my insurance bill, and I said to my insurance agent, who's been my insurance agent for over 30 years, I said, Lindy, I don't know why I'm paying insurance on a house that's worth maybe 130, 140,000, but my replacement cost is 240. I said, that's a hell of a difference. I honestly don't think my cost to build my house new today would be 240. She proved to me with some records it's worth about 220. If my house had to be built totally over again, pouring foundation and everything would be about 220. So the 240, the difference, you know what? I'm not going to argue that. With the insurance world, if you don't insure to 100% of that cost replacement value, if you have a catastrophe, the insurance company is going to come back and say, well, wait a minute. You're only insured 80% of value. You're only insured 70% of value. Therefore, we're only going to give you 80% or 70% of the value of the damages. So you want to insure to 100% of that cost approach, that cost value. Again. In the real world, when we do a cost approach, we also come back to it and we say, okay, my house was built in the 1930s. It's well, 90 years old. It's depreciated a heck of a lot in value. So we would take that 220 and we would depreciate it down in value. By depreciation, we would get it down to a value probably around 130, 140. Again, not out of range. We want to reconcile the values. This is where we put together all of our data. We look at all of our values and we reconcile them against each other. Why is one value making more sense? Why are we picking this value versus anything else? That's the reconciliation process. This is a question on your test, the reconciliation. What are you doing with real estate to figure out what's the value worth? Then you're going to report the final opinion of value. So we use Uniform Residential Appraisal Report, URAR. That's the report that you have. The blank for report, the report in your book, is the Fannie Mae Form 1004. That's just a common appraisal report that all appraisers use. And residential offices, real estate offices, lending offices, this is a report that they see floating around all the time. They're used to seeing this approach. Report. Now, the report I gave you and printed out for you is on letter size paper. Very often, I don't know why, but these reports are actually on legal size paper. I don't know why. It's hard to get legal size paper these days, but these reports traditionally have been on legal size paper. What is legal size paper? 11 half by 14. Instead of 8 and a half by 11, it's 11 by 14. 8 and a half by 14. The long, long, long paper is legal paper. So they're typically legal paper. I don't know why, but that historically goes back. It's just what it is. Common practice. Okay, so we do the appraisal, we look at value. When we look at value, we're looking at demand. What's the demand for this piece of property? Where is it located? How many bedrooms does it have? What is the market demand? Why do people want to have this property in this neighborhood? What's demand? Utility and scarcity transferability. If this property gets destroyed, if this property is no longer available, what is close to it? What can we substitute? What are we looking at? But we also have to understand that there's only one piece of property. I'm an identical twin. There are two of me, but we are individuals. 
there can be houses that are similar, but no two houses are identical properties because one has a different location than the other. Maybe built by the same builder, exact same floor plan, same finishes, but they have a different physical location, so they're not identical. So that's part of this whole scarcity transferability issue that we're looking at with real estate. So the market value, the most probably price a property will bring in a competitive market. This is also why we want to, when we do an appraisal report, we only look at properties that are sold because we have a way of verifying that they've sold. We've reached what we call the true arm's length transaction, the true market value when it's sold. The market price is the property's asking offer or sales price. There is a difference between a market price and the market value. The asking price is not necessarily what you sell it for. They might be the same number, but very rarely are they the same number. The, the actual selling, selling price can be higher or lower than the market price. Hot market. You go in, you, you put your house in the market, all of a sudden it sells for more than you listed it for. Wow. Then you think, well, I wasn't asking enough. Well, maybe you were, but there's more forces that are going on. Competitive marketplace, more than one bidder. So we can price it up. The basic principles of value. Anticipation. We're looking for it to happen. The change, competition in the marketplace, conformity. How does it conform in the neighborhood? Conform to the uses around it. The contribution, the highest and best use. How many of you have heard that word, the highest and best use, those words before? What do you think of when I ask you about highest and best use? Um, okay, the most out of using the property. The highest appraisal value. The highest profit. Okay. When I have a piece of property that's a farm property, and I'm going to put an interchange through that farm property, and it's been a farm property for 100 years, is this highest and best use still a farm property when I'm going to have an interchange right through the property? No. Is this highest and best use multifamily? Probably not. Is the highest and best use office? Maybe. Is the highest and best use industrial? Maybe, depending upon where we are on the highway, where trucks are going. Is the highest and best use retail? Retail is absolutely the highest price, but based on zoning and everything, can I make it retail? So highest and best use, we're going to look at the zoning. We're going to look at what's going on in the area. What can physically happen with the property when we want to redevelop it? Highest and best use, where my house sits in the neighborhood that it's in, several blocks off the main drag of Wooster Pike, this highest and best use is purely residential. There's nothing else I'm going to do with that house. Now, the houses that sit right on Wooster Pike, we've actually, through planning and zoning, we've come back and we've zoned three back in to be uh, retail zoning. And we did this years ago when I was on the planning commission, because we had somebody come to us and say, I'd like to build a Rite Aid at this corner property. But if I want to build a Rite Aid, i got to go three properties deep to be able to get the parking lot, the turn ratios, the drive through window, and everything that this really needs. But you're, the way your little community is zoned, I could only go two back without having to come for a zoning change. So when he came to us and told us what he was trying to do, we agreed it makes sense. We'll go ahead and help you do the zoning change at the Planning Commission. We'll help make that recommendation because it's a way to, to um, rebuild that corner property that really needs to be redeveloped, and it hasn't been yet. But we went ahead and said, okay, we'll agree to that. As the Planning Commission, we agree to that. So we gave those people that are two and three back a chance to make their property retail. Retail is a higher use, a higher money for their property. But is it physically happening yet? No, it still hasn't happened. But, well, no, one of them is not what No. It just, this was 10, eight, 12 years ago. It hasn't happened since because the owner of the particular corner hasn't found a better resale value yet. He just keeps using it. It's a snappy tomato pizza. So it's a commercial use. It still works. But the house next to him is rental. The house next to that or behind that is a garage. It's a house, but they're using it as a commercial garage. So it, it's in that kind of wheelhouse where it is a change of use. It, it meets the retail zoning. 
So again, when we look at highest and best use, we're looking at all the potential zoning use to, to blend with the area, what can be done with it. We also look at something called increasing and diminishing returns. We're going to look at plottage. And you're going to read about all these. I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but you'll read about them. So have some suspense so you'll learn a little more as you're going through this. We're going to be looking at regression and progression, substitution, and supply and demand. What did we start this class out with? Supply and demand. Supply and demand was one of the first things we learned about because supply and demand impacts the real estate market. Makes things happen faster, later, sooner. Controls timing, controls pricing, all kinds of things. So it's supply and demand has a very direct impact on our appraisal report. Supply and demand in the marketplace. So the three approaches to value, sales comparison approach, again, the market data approach. We go out, we look at properties that have sold. As an appraiser, that's all we're looking at. As a realtor, we're looking at listings, we're looking at expire listings. But as an appraiser, we're only looking at properties that have sold. Remember that distinction. The cost approach, we're looking at what would it cost to build this house brand new today. The foundation, the everything, and then we put a depreciation factor on it. There are several kinds of depreciation we can do. We can do a straight line depreciation. We can do double digit. We can do all kinds of accounting depreciation, but we're going to use a systematic method stating why we're choosing whatever method of depreciation, why we're stating that property. Again, my house is 80 something years old. Does my house only have a 100-year life? I don't think so. But I think over time, my house will be rebuilt, rebuilt, rebuilt. We've put a new roof on it. We've put a new driveway on it, new doors, windows, siding, new furnace, new you know everything, kitchen, bathrooms. We've rebuilt the house a lot in the 30-something years we've been there. But will be rebuilt again? Probably. The house can continue to be rebuilt. It has good bones, good structure to work with. Um, the income approach to value. We're going to look at a gross rent multiplier. We're going to use something called a gross income multiplier. For the residential real estate class, know that something called an income approach exists, but we're not going to use it because it really doesn't apply to what we're doing in our real estate reports. We can't give it any credibility because when people are buying a house for their home, they're not buying it for income. So they're not looking at it the same way. We can use the income approach if, if okay, we're, we're trying to come up with the, uh, we've got two staggering different numbers. The cost approach is one, the market data approach is another, staggering different numbers. We might bring an income approach in to say, wait a minute, can we get something that gives us a closer number that we can focus in on? That might be the only reason we'd ever, as a, an appraiser, look at an income approach because our other two approaches are very far off. Commercial properties, the income approach is our primary driver. Why are people buying investment real estate? They want to get income. So that's primarily their reason. That's what's driving them. The reconciliation. Again, analyzing and effectively weighing the findings from our three approaches. The appraiser explains not only the appropriateness of each approach, but also the relative reliability of the data within each approach in line with what types of value are sought. And then the appraiser explains how the data reflect the current market. Okay, so I want you to pull out the appraisal report on my kid's house. And I want you to look in the back of it here. He's got some notes. <coughs> it's a little bit fuzzy to read, but when you go through the report, he does the foundation, he does description of value, he shows us what the house is. Then there are three pages, or Two and a half, three pages of disclaimers. Two pages of disclaimer. But on page, the additional comments. He talks about, please note the appraiser's signature appearing on appraiser report's electronic signature. Um, this is this page here after the adjustments page. Additional comments. It would be the page one, two, three, four, five. Page five of the report. Additional comments where he's talking about some things that he looked at. Um, he's using use, use of Section 2010 use path to disclose any prior service subject he became aware of. Um, he's, again, some more disclaimers. It's page the third, the third five. Page. The third page. Third page, sorry. Page five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. 
Okay, so additional comments. This might be a section where, in this report, he's doing other comments, but this would be a place where somebody could say, this is why I'm using these three approaches to value. This is what I'm looking at. Okay, we're going to keep looking through the report to see. There should be somewhere here where he's showing us the reconciliation and why he's looking at what he's doing. He put in a supplemental addendum that gives us some more information. I'm looking for the place here. Yeah, it's a little bit fuzzy, but there's enough information you can work for from here. You've got the subject pictures, you've got comparable properties, you've got a market. It shows physically a map where the property is, what's going on, condition ratings and definitions. Keep going through here, condition ratings and definitions. And I'm still not seeing what I'm looking for, which is the reconciliation the value. The final summary that says what it is. Yeah. They're black and white and they're fuzzy. They've been reproduced a few times. They're not the best quality pictures. They work for what he's doing. Okay, if you go to page four, which is the back of the second page, summary of comparison approach, see attached addenda, the sales down at the bottom. Sales comparison approach was the only approach to value completed is reliable due to the availability of recent and close proximity units to the subject. The cost approach was considered but not complete due to Fannie Mae requirements and due to the inherent unreliability of the depreciation estimate. The income approach was not developed due to lack of reliable data. Where is this at? So this is the, okay. the bottom of the fourth page, the, second, the back of the second page. The back of the second page of the appraisal report. At the bottom. It says where it says the sales comparison approach was the only approach using. That's his reconciliation. So again, it's all of three lines of this report is the reconciliation. Okay, and that's all it has to be. That's all it has to be. Yeah. What's your question? Appraisals before we all have the sales approach and the cost approach, and obviously they're two different prices. So then which? I mean, now I'm thinking back. I don't know which one. They would have used this, the market, the sales comparison approach. The market value for residential property is the most reliable approach. So then why would they even give the cost approach? Because we're trying to find three values out there to help us center in on one value. Are they on the like mean, medium, mode? No, no, no. It, there's a scientific method, and that's what, in the reconciliation, he put why he didn't want to use the cost approach, because... It was completed. Due, it was not completed due to Fannie Mae requirements because of this loan and the package of what was going on. Right. And then the income approach was not developed due to a lack of reliable data. So he tells you exactly why he didn't use or why he threw out the other approaches mm -hmm. and why he's only solely relying on the market data approach. And that works. That worked for this report. And this is very typical of a residential medium low price house. The higher the price of the house, the more data may be in there, the more explanations may be done because you got more room for flux. This house, its value is 110. Okay. This was a house that they were asking 122 for. Max made an offer of 115. They accepted the offer. Then the appraisal report came back at 110. My kid about died. And he's like, what's going to happen with this? I, I won't be able to get it. I said, just relax. Go back. Let your realtor do their thing. That's what the realtor's here. That's why you have a realtor representing you and there's a realtor representing the seller. Let the realtor go back and explain to the selling realtor why we got this appraisal report. The fact that this appraisal report exists and convince them why they need to come down and value. And he was able, she was able to do that. So they accepted the 110 offer. So they, they revised the offer to 110 and sold the house at 110. So he came in literally at 100% of the offer. Is this reasonable in residential real estate? Very, the 100% of what the appraisal report is typically what people are financing. You, well, okay, and then you had to put 5% down, depending on what it is. But it's very common 
for the selling price to be 100% of the appraisal report. So again, not <coughs> uncommon. So again, so their reconciliation, why they use each approach, and how the data reflects the current market condition. Okay, so that's it the for the slide. What they're trying to get the yes, the appraiser is told when they go in the assignment, they understand a little bit about the contract. They don't have the sales contract in their but hands, they the but they know the price. So they're going in to try to meet that. Again, he came in lower, and, and he had to really, you know, again, this is what I feel it is. He justified it, and we, we had to work with it. Okay, so what I want you to do is we go through this appraisal report. I want you to look at, okay, now go to the second page. It lists the property, the buyer, the property, who he's buying it from, date of public record, the legal description. Okay, look at the legal description. Lot 5, Fairfield number 5, F2, 8 6. That's all the legal description is. It's not a whole convoluted deed legal description. It's a simple legal description for this form. So there are several kinds of legal descriptions that exist out there. But that's all we need for this. What year are they, what's the, the assessor's parcel number, the tax year, what's he looking at? Um, Quicken Loans is who he got his loan through. Subject is current list of Northern Kentucky MLS for 116.5 and is in pending status. The subject was originally listed on 520 for 121.5. Arm's length sale. The contract appears to be a standard purchase agreement for a typical arm's length transaction. This arm's length language. Understand what it means. Arm's length transaction is two buyers compelled, buyer seller, two people compelled to buy and sell a piece of real estate that are not related. There's no duress. There wasn't a bank foreclosure. There wasn't a short sale. They use this in short sales. I don't like the fact that they use it. An arm's length transaction is no duress. People are freely coming to the marketplace. They're buying and selling based on what the market is bearing. <coughs> um, based on the sales of the area, based on the sales and the report, the market does not support the subject's contract mm -hmm. price. Okay, this is where Max flipped. <laughs> it's, it's, so again, we educated and went back. And we got, he was able to get, so he paid $800 to have his appraisal report done twice because of what was going on. There was a leak that came back. We'll read through that and see that here. But he paid $800, but he get a $5,000 price reduction. So in the end, the kid made a good deal. He got what he was trying to get done. Um, if you read his Facebook page at the time he was buying this, you can mm -hmm. see all of his comments, what he was going through as a, as a young kid trying to buy a house. Oh, my God. I, now I have a home. What am I going to do? Um, so when we go down further, we can see the general description of the property. We have a foundation. We have the exterior description. It's concrete block, brick average, asphalt shingle average. Uh, the floor is carpet vinyl, uh, drywall plaster, painted wood, vinyl average, tile average in the bathroom, what is natural gas. Down below, no updates prior 15 years. The subject is average condition has been adequately maintained. Only normal physical depreciation is present, which has been estimated on an age life basis. The subject property has average functional utility. Okay, two things we just talked about there. Physical depreciation. Okay, and, and then the other thing was average functional utility. We have physical depreciation and we have physical obsolescence. We have functional obsolescence. These are two things you're going to read about in your textbook. Physical obsolescence is when a property physically can't be restructured. It is what it is. It physically can't be restructured or it's lying next to other properties. It doesn't control what its next door neighbor is. So the graveyard next door might be a real turnoff for a lot of people. Uh, some people it's a turn on, but a lot of people the graveyard next door is a turn off. And, and you can't change that physical nature. That's physically what the, where the house is physically located. You can't change it. Functional obsolescence. How many of you watch HGTV these days? Is there a house that has functional obsolescence? I don't think so. I think most of these houses, they go in, they blow out walls, they do this, they do that. They, they totally take care of any thought to your mind of functional obsolescence. But it costs money to do the work they're doing. When the average homeowner is coming in, this kid's looking at this house, 
he's not looking at this house to come in and tear walls down to buy it and do a lot of work. This kid's looking to buy this house so he can move right in. So he's living with the functional, physical obsolescence that might be present in the house. So that, those are two things you're going to consider. If they are really bad, the appraiser can make judgment calls and they can detract uh, from the, the subject properties. They can detract or add values based on functional and physical obsolescence. That's something we ask an appraiser to look at. But again, given the nature of how things get remodeled and what can happen today, a lot of things can be overcome with the right price, with the right dollar. Subject properties, typical and characteristics of the area, meets with the buyer expectations in terms of the general market appeal. No buyer resistance would be anticipated. So it's a typical house in his neighborhood. Very, very similar to the other houses in his neighborhood. The next page is 27 Julia. The subject property is always on the left. The other properties that they use for the comparable sale, number one, two, and three, uh, Roger Lane, St. Jude Circle, and Roger Lane. So these were houses that were close. And then, okay, the subject property is six rooms, four bedroom, one bath. Roger Lane had seven bedrooms, seven rooms, four bedroom, one bath. St. Jude, six, four bedroom, one bath. Roger, the other one, had seven bedroom, seven, four bedrooms, two baths. Okay, so what you're going to look at, you can see where they did pluses and minuses to the subjects. But everything they did on the subject properties, if you notice, they're all minuses. They're all minus reductions. So the subject properties in this example were all better houses than, excuse me, the comparable properties were all better than the subject. They subtracted value from all of those. So this appraiser went out for current sales, and he couldn't find a house that was worse than this. All the houses he found were slightly better. So he had to make reductions to the comparable houses to come up with that. You never adjust the subject property value. You only adjust the comparables up or down to make the comparables similar to your subject. So what you see is the house, the first property, after he did all of his $2,000 worth of adjustments, negative adjustments, the house sold for $109.9. After he's done adjustments, he's got a gross adjustment at $107.9. Uh, St. Jude sold for $110. After he makes adjustments, he has adjustments that got it down to $105.6. Roger Lane sold for $123. After he does adjustments, it's down to $112.2. So again, you're looking at these and you're even trying to go, where did he come up with 110? But 110 was kind of an average number, but 110 was what he called the value. And then where did he get the information? From courthouse, realist, courthouse, realist, courthouse, realist, courthouse, realist. As an appraiser, we also double check this information. Just because it's in the courthouse, just because it's in realist, or because it's wherever it's listed, in the MLS or whatever. We assume the information is correct, but we still verify it. We'll call a realtor involved in the sale. We'll try to find somebody who's involved in the sale to verify the accuracy of the information. The subject property is a prior transfer on 9-16-2013 for 104, which was a purchase by the current owner. The comparables have not been sold or optioned in the previous 12 months as the date of the valuation. So it goes on. Again, this is where he talks about the sales comparison approach is what he used. The next page is where he goes through additional comments. Then he has the cost approach to value. Okay, when you go down and look at the cost approach to value, there's a place to put it here. He's got a cost approach to value that says that this property um, cost approach, he's putting $15,000 for the site work, a 55,000, 55 average year span. But the income approach was not developed, then below, the income approach was not developed, the lack of data. The cost approach, he didn't really complete it to give you a total value there. Okay. And then the next couple pages is of all is, is just saying, I'm not responsible for this. I don't do this. I've got an appraiser certification. Then on the next, after those few pages, he lists his comparable number four, five, and six. So he did the right thing. He went out in the marketplace and he tried to find six good comparables. And he states all of his good comparables here. 
And 4, 5, and 6, 4 had a value of 112 after you adjusted. 5 had a value of 112, 650. And 6 had a value of 114, 1. So he threw those three. They're still here, but he didn't give as much pertinence to those. He put them on the back. And, and that's why he said comparable 4 to 6 have not been sold or optioned either. But comparable 4 was, was included due to lack of similar sales in the area and was used to help support the subject's appraised value. Comparable 5 and 6, although an active listing, pending sale were used to fulfill lender requirements. This lender said they wanted 6. They asked for 6 comparable sales. No weight was given in the final value estimate to 4, 5, and 6. So it tells you what he did. Next page, again, market conditions addendum, total comparable sales, more information about conventional and non-conventional financing, prominent locale. Based on the appraiser's experience, MLS statistics and conducting age interviews, our records indicate that foreclosure sales do not have a predominant factor in the subject's market area. That was good to hear. There's not a lot of foreclosure sales in that little neighborhood. Additionally, with the current availability of good interest rates coupled with a balance and other market factors for provide for a healthy market in subjects neighborhood. Again, those are all good things that somebody wants to see. The bank likes to see that language. It supports them lending money on the property. So he's, he's building it up then too. And then again, supplemental denim, more information about it. Then you go back in and you can see the subject photo page. You can see the inside of the, the property. Then you see comparables, one, two, and three. You see the, the fronts and back, and then you see comparable four, five, and six. You see the basic floor plan, the sketch of the house. And you'll see a map that shows where the house is. You'll see the comparables. Again, these comparables are all within a mile and a half of this house. So it was pretty easy to find comparables that were close. Again, this neighborhood, what's going on, lots of these little houses were all built in the late 50s. Easy to get to these houses. Easy to make it happen. Then more information on what he did with the, unit, the appraisal report. Okay, so any questions about an appraisal report? The farthest radius depends. Again, if this was a half a million dollar home and there was a, only a pocket of half million dollar homes but they hadn't had a lot of sales, they could go a few miles down the road to find half million dollar homes. Um, again, because it's a $110,000 home, $120,000 less, there's a lot in this area that's available. When we did the commercial report on the building in the Ohio Casualty former headquarters in downtown Hamilton, our appraiser found another property in Hamilton, but he went to Milwaukee, he went to other parts of the country, because he was looking for small towns like Hamilton that had corporate headquarters that were for sale. So he went all over the country. He had to make dollar adjustments because of distance and stuff like that, but he had to, he had to search far and wide to find comps. So again, the more involved it is, the higher the price, the further you may have to go. For residential, they should be close. Huh? No, residential, you're not allowed to do that. You want to be close. And again, within six months. Commercial, he had to go a year, two years out to find sales. To get to get something that was a similar situation. So it depends on what you're trying to do. So if someone's buying cash, do you even need an appraisal? If somebody's buying cash, you do not need an appraisal. Um, you may, okay. The person that's buying cash should know what the market value right. is making a, a smart offer. But the person's buying cash, cash may not ever have a phone price, but they'll have a CMA. They'll have their realtor give them a CMA to make sure they're doing the right thing. They'll use the CMA to help them buy their insurance. They'll use the CMA to, to list the property value in their asset pool. But no, they do not have to have a formal appraisal. Some of those mamma jamma houses in California where you know, people are buying them, you know, oh, all cash offer or something, mm -hmm. $3 million. So right. Nothing requires, the, the reason formal appraisals are required in our market is because banks require them. And it's government funded money, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, different things like that. They require formal licensed appraisers to do the report. But no, cash sales never require that. Cash sale, you don't have to buy title insurance, but we would tell you to do it to protect your interest. Go back and look at it. Any other questions?